In 2008, Jeff McDonald was diagnosed with anxiety fuel depression. At the time, he was the global VP of human resources for Unilever. His recovery led him to determine a new purpose and become a global advocate, campaigner, and consultant addressing the stigma of mental ill health in workplaces. Hey folks, welcome back to the Evolving Leader Podcast. I'm Scott Allender, co-host of the show. John Gomes is off doing some important in-person leadership work today, so um, I'll be flying solo. He'll be missed, um, and I know he's envious of the conversation I get to have today. I've been looking forward to this for quite some time, and I'm truly honored to introduce you to our guest today. Today we are joined by Jeff McDonald. Jeff is a global advocate, uh, campaigner, and consultant who is passionate about addressing the stigma of mental ill health in workplaces and about helping organizations embed purpose as a key driver of business performance. Prior to this, he was the Global Vice President of Human Resources for Unilever. Jeff, welcome to the show. Scott, thanks for having me, and I so look forward to the conversation that you and I are going to have, so thank you. Yeah. Uh, Let's just jump in and start perhaps with you know, the event that changed the course of your life from a peak career point to what you've been on a mission to do for the past decade? Yeah, Scott, I think there were, I think there were, two, there were two incidents. Um, one didn't immediately change my career path, but the second did. Hmm. So the one that had a huge impact on where I am today and the work that I've been doing over the last almost nine years was myself getting very, very ill back in 2008 with anxiety-fueled depression at a time when I was a global VP for HR in Unilever looking after all of our home care division around the Unilever world. And I got very, very ill with anxiety-fueled depression. Hmm. Now, there was only one thing that kept me alive in my darkest moments, and I often say this, and that was two of the most powerful emotions in the world. One is called love and the other one is called hope. Hmm. And when I was diagnosed, I made a decision not to be burdened by the stigma of depression and anxiety. And in many ways that empowered me and it allowed me to talk openly about my illness to my family, to some of my friends and to some of my colleagues at work. And you know, Scott, what I got back from them was the most wonderful outpouring of the most powerful emotion in the world called love. Hmm. And then I always used to meet with a friend every 10 days. He was a colleague, in fact, who two years prior to my illness had been so sick, he had been admitted to the Priory here in the UK. I was never that ill. And I used to meet with Martin every 10 days. And I saw he was better. He gave me hope. He just gave me that little bit of light at the end of the tunnel. Because, I mean, I had to take three months off work. I mean, there was no ways I could be at work. And so my recovery, and of course, part of my recovery, yes, there was medication, there was cognitive behavioral therapy, they were slowly getting back onto my bicycle. But I think the most two powerful ingredients to my recovery was a sense of love and feeling loved and a sense of hope. And so, yes, I go back into Unilever after, you know, as I recover, 2010, I have a bit of a relapse. And then in 2012, and this probably was the catalyst that led me onto the path that I'm now on, I lost a very good friend to suicide. Mm -hmm. He was an alpha male, and he was the sort of guy who just could not talk about his emotional and mental struggles. And instead, he died by suicide. And the night he died, I lay in bed, Scott, and I thought to myself, and you know what, I'm not a therapist, I'm not a psychologist, I'm not an expert in mental health, I'm just somebody with some lived experience who's trying to do some good with that in the world. And I lay there and I thought, what's the difference between him and me? And I came to two conclusions. The first conclusion I came to was I'd been able to talk, I'd been able to experience a sense of love and a sense of hope, he couldn't. And the second conclusion I came to was that stigma had just killed my friend because had he had a physical illness, common physical illness, he would have just put his hand up, spoken to his wife, gone and seen a doctor. But because he was struggling mentally or emotionally, he couldn't do that. And instead he died by suicide. And that Scott was the catalyst 
That was really the catalyst. That then led me to do a piece of work in Unilever. I co-led a piece around breaking stigma for about a year and a half. And then I left Unilever middle of 2014 to go out into the world and to live a life fueled by a very, very deep sense of purpose. And that is to try and create workplaces. And not only workplaces, Scott, you know, family groups, friendship groups all over the world where every single person in those settings feels 100% comfortable to just put their hand up and ask for some help if they were struggling with a common form of mental ill health, just like they would if they had a common physical illness. Hmm. Thank you for, for sharing that. Um, and I'm really sorry for the loss of your friend. Um, I'd like to understand more about, you know, the, the first anxiety fueled, you know, depression attack that you had. I'd like to understand more about what that moment was like for you and, you know, what it felt like and what, you know, how you had to get your head around it in, in, in this experience that's happening to you. And then I'd love to hear more about what you've talked about love and hope. What did that look like in practicality? How did that yeah. wrap around you? Yeah, Scott, you know, I mean, up until, and I'll never forget the date, 25th of January, 2008. And the reason I don't forget that date is because the 26th of January, 2008, my eldest daughter was going to turn 13. So you can imagine how much excitement there's in our household that evening before yeah. this young girl at midnight is going to go through a rite of passage and become a teenager. Mm -hmm. And at midnight on the 25th, I get woken up with the most massive panic attack. Now, Scott, I had never experienced a panic attack in all my life. I mean, the word panic attack, I mean, it wasn't even part of my vocabulary. I mean, I, I don't think I'd ever, ever engaged, spoken to anybody about a panic attack, never come across anybody who'd had a panic attack. And so I'm lying in bed and the ends of my fingers are tingling. The ends of my toes are tingling. My heart is beating profusely. I'm struggling to regulate the breathing. The bed sheets, they are wet with sweat, wet. And because I'm so naive to what's going on, you can imagine. I mean, the first thing I think is I'm about to have a heart attack. Mm -hmm. And I, I remember bumping my wife, Debbie, and I said, Deb, I, I'm going to have a heart attack. And she, she asked me why, and I tried to explain the feelings I was feeling. And she said, well, why don't you get up and just walk around the room and take some deep breaths, which I did. And I mean, even as I talk to you right now, I can feel some of that anxiety. <sighs> you know, every time I tell this story, I, I just feel a bit of it. And what I usually do now is I take a big, big deep breath. Mm -hmm. And um, the feelings of anxiety began to subside. Um, and I got back into bed, but I, I mean, I just couldn't go back to sleep. And I couldn't go back to sleep for three reasons. The one is the adrenaline was pumping through my body. Secondly, I was petrified. I was absolutely petrified, Scott, that if I fell back to sleep, it would happen again. Sure. And I, I mean, I would not wish it on my worst enemy, a panic attack. And the third reason I couldn't go back to sleep was I developed a capability from midnight on the 25th of January, 2008. I developed a capability to catastrophize over the most insignificant issues in my life. I mean, if you want some detail, I mean, I got up at about three in the morning and I had a sore on the inside of my mouth. And I remember going into the bathroom, interrogating the sore and getting back into bed. And Scott, I convinced myself through my ability to catastrophize that I now had the beginnings of frozen mouth cancer and I was going to die of cancer. Hmm. But, you know, when I reflect on all of that back in 2008, I mean, there were telltale signs beforehand. Do you know what I mean? I think I was very lucky, Scott. I was so lucky. I mean, in some ways, I was so lucky that I had the panic attack because it was like, it was the last straw to break the camel's back. It was the last straw to break the camel's back. But they were clearly, now that, you know, when I reflect and I think about it, and I wish somebody had taught us this stuff, you know, when we were growing up, you know, at school, you got taught physical education, or my mother taught me dental hygiene, you know, brush your teeth before you go to sleep and brush your teeth in the morning. Guess what? My, my teeth haven't fallen out. But nobody, nobody taught us about mental hygiene and to be aware of some of the telltale signs. And so things like, you know, and, and by the way, this, the, the, what I'm going to share with you is what happened to me. And remember, we're all unique, wonderful human beings and not everybody is the same. And our beauty comes from 
from being unique. But but what happened to me was there was, you know, my sleep became, and, and by the way, and it persisted for four or five weeks, all right? So it wasn't as if I'd had two nights of bad sleep or a week. It just persisted where I'd go to sleep and I'd wake up at about two in the morning and I would just lie there and worry about stuff and feel anxious. I'd stopped, I'd stopped having breakfast and lunch because I used to wake up feeling anxious. And so I started to lose a lot of weight. I just lost a lot of weight. I stopped looking forward to doing the things that I love doing, like going for a mountain bike ride on a Saturday morning with my mates or a swim of a morning in a pool. I mean, I just, I just didn't have the energy. I just didn't feel like doing it. I didn't. And I mean, I am passionate about my cycling and I, I didn't even want to get on a bicycle. You know, I remember I used to get on the train of a morning and, and not be able to read a newspaper because anything that was sad in a newspaper would just really trigger me, would really trigger me. I wouldn't want to do stuff on a Friday evening, on a Saturday evening of a long you know, week at work where you want to get together with mates and friends. I mean, I wouldn't look forward to anything like a holiday or I, I just didn't look forward to stuff. And, you know, Scott, those were some telltale signs. And, you know, I often say, people often ask me, so what are the symptoms? And I always preface it by saying, look, those were probably the symptoms for me and I'm different uh, to you. But there's a general rule and there's a general principle, which is if ever you notice in yourself or you notice in people that you're leading, you're working with, you're living with, you're friends with, if you notice a shift in your normal behavior, because we all know one another's normal behavior. I know my normal behavior. You know yours. You know your peers, your friends. If you see a shift in normal behavior, but that shift persists for at least four or five weeks, it's worth a conversation. Not always a conversation which says, how are you? Because we all just say, are oh, we fine? Of course. You know, I think it's about how are you feeling? Mm. That question. Or how are you sleeping? That sort of question. Because asking a question of somebody who you've noticed a real shift in their behavior and just saying to them, how are you sleeping? That opens up a completely different conversation to me just saying, how are you? Completely. So when you were doing this self-reflection and, and recognizing that these signs were here, how, how long in, in your past had this been going on before you had the anxiety? I think at least five weeks, five, six mm. weeks, I'd been feeling like that, at mm. least, you know. But I just, I just thought I was a bit stressed. You know, there was some stuff going on at work. I was, there was some stuff going on, you know, at home. I was beginning to localize. I'd been an expat in Unilever for 20 odd years. I was now going to have to you know, become a local, buy a house, take all this money out of the bank that I'd saved over 20 years and plow it into a property, you know, um, some stressful stuff going on at work. You know, uh, there was just there was just there was just some stuff going on at the same time, and um, and you know we've all got different tolerance levels to stress. You know, Scott. I mean, I cannot handle it when people say, "Oh, well, you're strong and you're weak," or that must have strengthened you. Well, you know what? I grew as a result of my experience, mm -hmm. and there's no such thing as being strong or weak. We are just unique human beings. We're all different. And we should just we should just celebrate those mm. differences. And my levels of tolerance to stress are different to yours. And if a lot of stuff gets thrown at you at any one time, some people can handle it better than others. I mean, that's just the reality of being a unique human being. Not that yeah. you're stronger than me or weaker than me. You're just different. Mm. I couldn't agree more. So let's turn to the work you did at Unilever and then when you left there um, and the work you've been doing since, because I'm really interested for our, our listeners who are leaders that are listening right now, what, you know, what, how people can start to think about this, um, you know, what can leaders do with their teams um, and each other to normalize the mental health conversation? Yeah. So, you know, I often say, um, Scott, I always I often say that leaders can leaders can can lead for some stuff at what I would call the organizational level, right? But leaders can also just do something as compassionate human beings. Forget about what the organization is doing 
And look, the organizations have to start doing some stuff in this space, but just let's start at the individual level as a leader. I think that there are three things that individuals can do. And I often say, you know, after I've done any speaking engagement around the world or wherever I'm at, I always end by saying, please, please join me on my crusade. And you don't need to wait for your organization to get all the ducks in a row and get all the resources behind the initiative. And by the way, I'm provoking you to do that. But as individuals, just join me on a crusade. And there are three things you can do as a leader. And by the way, I think leaders run vertically right through organizations, not just about very mm -hmm. senior people. A shift manager in a factory is a leader. Number one, reflect on your own relationship to mental ill health. Please just go away and reflect on that. And what is that relationship? Is it one of intolerance or is it one of true compassion? And if you are intolerant, I just ask you to do one thing for me. Go and be curious. Hmm. Just go and be curious around the subject of mental ill health, depression, anxiety, bipolar. Go and read about it. Listen to a podcast on it. Go and find a homeless person in the street. Have a conversation with them. But just be curious. And I think the more curious you become, the better your awareness, your understanding, and hopefully a sense of compassion or empathy. So that's the first thing we could mm -hmm. all do. I think the second thing, Scott, that we can all do is we can all just start the conversation in our organizations, amongst our friends, amongst our family. And I'm not saying you have to get into a detailed expertise conversation around mental health, but you can just start the conversation around what, what do we think depression is? How do we think it might feel? You know, what is anxiety? How might that feel? You know, what do we think are some of the symptoms? I mean, just start the conversation. Because I honestly believe that if, if you can just get the conversation going around that boardroom table, the executive team table, you know, anything becomes possible, Scott. You know, John F. Kennedy, I mean, I don't know, he was sitting in the White House one day and he kind of got a couple of people around the table and said, hey, how about putting somebody on the moon and bringing them back safely? Well, guess mm. what? I mean, it happened. You know, Elon Musk has been talking about putting us into Mars, you know, space travel. I mean, these things all happened as a result of one conversation. Mm -hmm. And then finally, Scott, I implore people, and yes, they need to feel safe. They need to feel maybe coached. They need to feel uh, they've got the right permissions. But please tell your story because we've all got a story. And, you know, we don't all have a story like mine, which is a crucible moment and is very rarely impacted. But we've all got a story of some sort of association with somebody that we love or we treasure or we respect who has suffered from anxiety or depression. We've all got a story. Now, if you're going to tell a story of somebody else, I always say, please get their permission first. But just start sharing some of those stories. And the more stories we tell, I often say it's like sending a lifeboat out into the ocean. And the billions of people that are suffering in silence, as you and I are talking this, this evening, when they hear that story, when they see that lifeboat, they just cling on to it. And they realize two things. The first thing they realize is they're not alone. And the second thing they realize is they might just be normal, just normal mm -hmm. human beings. And so three things that individuals can do. Reflect on your relationship to mental ill health. Get the conversation going. When you're ready, tell your story. Now, what, could you, what can happen at an organizational level? And what am I seeing as I've journeyed this path over the last eight, nine years in helping organizations work through this? There's some critical success factors that need to be put in place. I mean, the first thing, Scott, is if you're going to go down this route of beginning to address the stigma of mental ill health in your workplace, understand that success looks like more people putting their hand up. Mm. And if that's going to happen, make sure you've got the support, the support resources in place. Because line managers, leaders are not psychiatrists, they are not therapists. But what you can do, you can sign post, and you know what every single one of them can do? They can love. Hmm. They can love. 
They can show compassion. They can show love to the person who might be struggling. But make sure you've got those support resources in place. Number one, critical success factor. The second spot is to train every single person right across the organization with some basic awareness training around mental health, mental ill health. Now, I'm not saying you have to go on a two-day mental health first aid course or whatever. I mean, but what I am saying is that in every induction program, in right across, I mean, when I was a Unilever, we had obligatory training, which was our code of business principles. There should be obligatory training across every organization that we train people some basic stuff around health. Because the more we train people, the more we educate them, the greater the degree of awareness, understanding, empathy, and compassion. So training, training, training. And you know, Scott, I often say, we spend billions in health and safety. You'll know this. You're in, you're in, you work in a big corporate. We spend billions in health and safety. Guess what? It all goes to safety. It all goes to keeping people physically safe at work. And by the way, you can't join an organization without having had some training in some safety. You can't go into some organizations without watching a video before you go in on safety. And they call it the health and safety pamphlet. And then I say to them, please remove the word health because you've done nothing around health here. This is all about safety. But why don't we also want to keep people emotionally and mentally safe at work? Why are we just concerned about keeping people physically safe? So training, training, training. And if you haven't got the money, take it from the safety budget because there will be money in the safety budget to do some of that training. So that's the second thing. The third thing is to, is to, is to drive up the awareness through campaigns, three or four campaigns a year. And you know, Scott, I often say that brand mental health is the most damaged brand I've ever come across. Hmm. The most damaged brand. You know why? Why? Because when you hear the word mental health, you immediately go to illness. Hmm. You go to depression, you go to psychosis, schizophrenia, anxiety. When you hear the word physical health, you don't immediately go to glandular fever, cancer. You know, if you and I were in London and we were walking up Regent Street and we decided we were going to go into the Nike store. So we'd walk into the Nike store and what would we see all over the walls? I mean, yes, we'd see the Nike emblem, but we'd also see pictures of, I call them chiseled whippets. <laughs> people with the most beautiful bodies and you kind of look at me scott and you say to me jeff jeepers wouldn't you love a body like that and i say oh yes and guess what i do i go and buy a pair of running shoes okay i mean the pictures that we see around physical health can be so inspirational yet when it comes to mental health the images we see are so negative they're black and white some guy in a mental asylum with a white coat on and so i encourage leaders that if they are going to do some campaigns and awareness building, try and find a positive angle to mental health. You know, mental health is a wonderful thing to have. It's a wonderful thing to have good mental health. It means I've got good cognitive abilities. I can concentrate. I can look at some data. I can make good judgments. And so, and so yes, raise, you know, do some campaigns around stigma, but also balance it with some really encouraging positive campaigns around maintaining good mental health and how you go about doing that. So that's the third thing. And then finally, and it applies at the individual level and also at the organization level, leaders, tell your stories. Hmm. Tell your stories. Show some vulnerability. Show some vulnerability. You grow every time you do that. And the way in which you then deepen your relationships with the people that you're leading through that sense of vulnerability, through that sense of vulnerability, is incredible. And look, I know, I mean, let's be pragmatic about this. While we live in a world of stigma, you get some CEOs who are really concerned about doing some of that because they've got a chairman or a chairwoman who's going to, you know, what's this going to mean in terms of, well, you know, you might not, maybe it's not your own, maybe you don't want to share your own story of how you feel, but you will have a story of your association with mental ill health, and that will be a positive story. I know it'll be a positive story of either the support you gave that person or how you encourage them. Um, but as I say, if you're going to tell a story of somebody else, then get their permission first. You know, I'll bring that to life um, for you, Scott. 
I mean, in Unilever, when we were doing this work, you know, when I came out of the closet, as it were, <laughs> and shared my story, well, guess what happened? Okay? Other leaders, line managers began to share their stories. Hmm. And we had a chief scientist, Scott. His name was David Blanchard. I'll never forget it. And I remember he came into the office one day after getting his daughter's permission. And he wrote a blog to his 3,000 scientists around the Unilever world. And he titled the blog, What is it like to be the father of a daughter who suffers from general anxiety disorder? Do you know when that blog hit the airwaves and the female scientist in Bangalore, do you know she suddenly realized that she had a boss and a companionate relationship to mental health? She knew she could put her hand up and just ask him for some help if she needed to. So you can see how powerful a story of somebody else can also yeah. be. Um, so yeah, um, you know, in summary, at an organizational level, get those support structures in place, do the training, run the campaigns, and share some of the stories. Hmm. So much wisdom and, and really practical insights. Um, and I can just feel your sincerity and, and your, your, your deep care for all of this. And it's, it's, thank you for sharing all that. Um, can we, can we learn a little bit more about your, your charity minds at work? Oh, thank you for giving me that opportunity to talk about minds at work, Scott. Um, you know, when I left Unilever at the end of 2014, I was just in the right job which was all about helping to archetype Unilever's transformation with purpose at its core. So Paul Pullman arrives in 2009. I happen to be in a job um, in 2010, which is business partnering the chief marketing communications and sustainability officer called Keith Reed, who is then tasked with rediscovering Unilever's purpose, building the Unilever Sustainable Living Plan, and then embedding, embedding its purpose using the Sustainable Living Plan as the vehicle through which we would embed and live our purpose as an organization. And that, I spent five years helping to archetype that transformation. And five years down the track, the share price goes from like 10 pounds to 30 pounds, we become the third most, the third most attractive company to work for in the world. And I think to myself, imagine if I could do it for myself. Imagine if I could be very clear on my own sense of purpose and go out into the world and be fueled by that sense of purpose. And so as I leave Unilever, for those first six months, I'm kind of in that sort of very divergent phase where I'm just mm -hmm. networking, meeting people, et cetera, et cetera. And something strikes me. And what strikes me is the number of people that I meet, Scott, who are senior who've had mental ill health experiences and who want to go back into their workplace and now do something about it and create an environment where there is no stigma. And I must have met 14 or 15 of those sort of people. And one of them was a lady called Georgie Mack. And I remember saying to Georgie one day, I said, Georgie, why don't we just bring these 14 people together? who are all interested in doing the same thing rather than everybody trying to do their own thing because there's more power in the group than there is an individual. And so Georgie offers me a, a space in her offices up near Regent's Canal. Um, and we choose a date that is suitable to Georgie and myself, the only two people on the planet. We choose a date and a time and we invite these 14 people. Well, guess what, Scott? Every single one of them arrives that night. Six o'clock to nine o'clock. Nobody phones to say they've got a sore toe or their daughter need, has suddenly got sick or they need to go to the vet. Or I mean, every single one of them arrives. And those 14 have now grown into a network across the UK of close to 2,300 people. Wow. And the purpose of Minds at Work, and yes, four years down the track, we had to move from being this network running these live events, five or six a year, where we would bring people together to feel inspired and equipped to go back into their workplaces and address the stigma of mental ill health. And so, you know, about a year and a half ago, we, we, we became a formal charity. And, uh, and, our, and our 
And our purpose is to inspire and to equip individuals to go back into their workplaces, address the stigma of mental ill health, and create a culture and environment where people can truly, truly flourish in what they are doing. And we're beginning to pivot. Our audience has always been just any individual. Any individual is welcome to our events, is welcome to come and feel inspired and equipped. But we're now beginning to pivot and we'll continue with the events. But we also want to offer that kind of service of knowledge and skills to the SME community, small, medium-sized enterprises. Because you know, Scott, if you're running a business of 60, 100 people, CEO, you haven't got a big well-being function or a big HR function where you could draw on their expertise or you're part of a network of other big businesses where you're learning stuff. And so what we want to begin to offer is to the SME community, we want to offer leaders in SMEs the opportunity to come and peer and get peer support, peer network, and learn from one another on how to do those kind of work. So that's that's what Minds at Work mm. is all about. Thank you for thank you for asking. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. That's that's incredible. Um, let's let's shift a little bit. I'm curious on your thoughts on on social media. Obviously, social media has played a pivotal role in mental health issues, particularly among young people leading to, as you would well know, increased rates of anxiety and depression. And I've even heard stories of suicide. Um, of course, perhaps, you know, not everything to do with social media is bad, of course, but it's kind of netting out in a very concerning way. So what's your thoughts on the accountability that Facebook and others are taking? And as the metaverse makes the world even more influential on our lives, what's your mission in this area? Wow. Big question. And I suppose it's delving into a space where I can't, as I said to you earlier, you know, I'm not an expert on mental health. Mm -hmm. I'm just somebody with some lived experience, an ordinary guy who's trying to make a small difference in the world. But of course, through my work, it has become apparent to me that social media, Instagram, Facebook, two platforms that had wonderful, wonderful visions and a sense of purpose once upon a time have and are experiencing real unintended consequences and a hugely, hugely negative impact on the mental health of young people and adults, but in particular young people. And I, from just where I sit as an ordinary guy in the street, I don't see those platforms doing enough to address this. I don't see them coming out and putting their full weight behind initiatives around mental health, supporting mental health services, um, educating in this particular space. I mean... It, unless I'm blind to it, but it's not apparent to me. And so I think they should be held far more accountable, far more accountable on the impact. You know, Scott, when I was, when I was bullied at school, I'd go home and I'd cry to my mum, and she would comfort me and she would take care of me. And the bullying was over. Now what happens? I get bullied at school through social media. I go home. I go into my bedroom and the bullying continues. Don't tell me that that is not impacting right. the mental health of young people. And those platforms, those platforms have got a lot, have got a lot to answer for. Hmm. You know, there's a lovely platform that's being developed. It's called Supernova. And essentially what it's trying to do is it's trying to do good in the world. So it's trying to... Um, It'll never move people away from Facebook and Instagram. But what it's trying to do is it's trying to create a replica of an Instagram. Um, but every time you like something, your like counts for funds that go to your charity of choice. Oh, really? Yep. And so organizations who will in time advertise on the platform, some of that, that money that is generated 
is used to contribute to your charity. So if Scott comes on to Supernova, you choose a charity that you want to support. And every time you post something and you get a certain number of likes, X amount of money then goes to your charity. You know, and it's about, it's about creating a platform that is trying to do some good in the world. Mm. Trying to do some good in the world. Versus one where the unintended consequences have been horrific. You know, Scott, every 40 seconds, somebody takes their own life in the world. Every 40 seconds. And we've seen, we've seen the dramatic increase in mental ill health, suicide amongst young people between the ages of 10 and 18. And I think those platforms need to take some accountability for that. Yeah. But as I say, I'm not an expert and um, I'm not talking to you from a strong evidence base. It's just as I've journeyed this path, it's what I see and what I hear. Mm -hmm. If you're enjoying The Evolving Leader, please head over to Apple Podcasts and leave us a review. And don't forget to follow along on Instagram and LinkedIn. You can find us at Evolving Leader. Thank you for listening. Now, let's get back to the show. Can we talk a little bit about how parents can help their children, whether their children is, you know, they're aware of their children experiencing some mental ill health or just in trying to protect them from social media influences? What are some of your thoughts about the role of parents as leaders in their family and of their children? Yeah, yeah. I mean, again, you know, I mean, I think the first thing is that parents have got to be so in tune with their children's behavior. And they've got to be so, so in tune with some of the symptoms of mental ill health. They've got to be so in tune and looking out for, just like they would look out for a sniffle here and there, look out for those shifts in normal behavior that I've spoken about. You know, you're never, you're never ever going to prevent a child from participating in Instagram or Snapchat or Facebook or whatever they're on. I suppose, I suppose, that, you know, the gift that you can give to your child. And again, I'm no pedagogist or somebody who understands all this stuff. But I think the gift that we should be giving to our children is to ensure that our children feel 100% comfortable, confident, and proud of who they are. Who they are as a child. But you know what's so sad is that most parents, I suppose, are both working. Most parents are full on caught up in the rat race. You know, you go on holidays and you see families sitting around breakfast tables all on their devices. And I think we just need to stop. And I think as a parent, we need to dedicate far more time energy and effort in ensuring that our child feels confident, proud, and 100% comfortable in their own skin. Mm -hmm. So that when they see some of this stuff on Instagram and Facebook and Snapchat, yes, some people's lives are better than mine and yours. But guess what? I'm content and I'm confident in who I am as a human being. And I think that's the challenge for parents today. Hmm. So let's um, kind of come full circle um, to where we started. Um, I'm thinking about many people that are listening right now might be just like you were back in 2008, you know, completely unaware of their anxiety or their depression. And, you know, they haven't really been able to do the reflection of figuring out, you know, what shifts, what signs maybe showed up. And, and some of that may be because nothing's felt normal in the last 20 months since COVID. Yeah. Right. And there's yeah. been a lot of disruption in, in people's yeah. routines and how they experience friendships and yeah. community and all of these things. So what might you say um, to those that are listening right now, how they can get more connected with their inner experience before their bodies sound the very scary alarm system. Yeah. 
So I think the first thing I would preface my answer, I want to say the following. But this pandemic, of course, it's had physical effects on all of us. But, you know, it's also had psychological effects on all of us, on every single one of us. There is nobody immune from the psychological effects of this pandemic. And let me tell you why. There are factors that you've just touched on. One, uncertainty. We've all felt a huge degree of uncertainty, and with uncertainty comes anxiety. We have all, particularly during lockdown, experienced a significant disruption to our social connections. And like you said, as human beings, we rely on connection with one another. We are a species that thrives off relationship and connection, and those have been disrupted. There are some of us who've experienced trauma through the pandemic the loss of a loved one. There are others, single mothers, single fathers, who've had to now learn to school their kids, work from home, complete disruption, as you said, to a normal schedule. There are others who have had to deal with this working from home and particularly as an introvert have felt um, that maybe they've become invisible and how is this all going to work and what does this mean for my career? And so in many ways, Scott, I want to say to people who are listening to us, it's okay not to be okay. Mm -hmm. Now, as I reflect on my own crucible moments in life, whether that was my anxiety fueled depression back in 2008, 2010, the loss of my friend, I think what that also taught me is that the most valuable asset that I have is my well-being. There can be nothing, Scott, more important than my health. Now, when I use the word health, I'm including my physical health, my emotional health, my mental health, and having that sense of purpose and meaning in my life. And so you know what is the most important priority in my life? is my health. And because it's the most important priority in my life, I will dedicate... 60 to 90 minutes every single day using an acronym that I'm going to share with you. But to protect myself in these challenging, challenging times. But because my health is the most important priority, guess what? I find the 60 or 90 minutes every day. And then people say to me, Scott, they say, where do you find 60 or 90 minutes every day to dedicate to your health? And then I say to them, you know what? They're 1,440 minutes in a day. Haven't you got 60 for yourself? You know the air steward on an aeroplane, when the, if the aeroplane's going to go down and they've done your safety briefing, they tell you to put the oxygen mask on first and then attend to your daughter sitting next to you. How often do we put the oxygen mask on ourselves? Somebody once said, make time for your wellness. Because if you don't, you might one day be forced to make time for your illness. You have mm -hmm. no choice. You have no choice. And so I want to leave you with a very, and our listeners, with a simple little acronym that I think I saw in a homeless shelter. And the acronym was called CAN DO. And the C in CAN DO stands for connection. So I will find five minutes, 10 minutes, every single day to do some connection. What does that look like, Scott? I'll connect with a friend that I haven't spoken to for ages. I'll connect with one of my daughters who's living up in London. I'll go and connect with nature. The A stands for be active. So I will find 30 minutes every single day to be active, whether that's to go for a walk around the block, a little jog, a swim, or whatever. And not if you don't have to run a marathon, but just be active. 30 minutes every single day I will dedicate to being active. It's good for my physical health. The more active I am, the better I sleep, the more I watch what I eat and drink, which is all good for my physical health. The N in can do, Scott, stands for just be nice to somebody every single day. 30 seconds. Just be nice. See what that does to a sense of meaning, a sense of purpose, when you can just be nice to somebody. I think it was Plato who once said, be kind to everyone we meet. Why? Because we're all fighting a harder battle. 
Just be nice. 30 seconds. Say thank you. Well done. The D in can do stands for discover. Be curious. Learn a new skill. Learn something new. Spend five minutes, 10 minutes. I'll do five, 10 minutes. I'll listen to a podcast. I'm listening to old Poland's book now, Net Positive. But I'm just being curious. It's so good for our mental health. Do a Sudoku. Do a crossword. Finish a jigsaw. I mean, it's so good just to oil the neural pathways by being curious and learning something new every single day. Learn a new skill. And finally, and my biggest challenge, Scott, my biggest challenge is to learn the O is to learn to just observe. Now, what do I mean by observation? I mean, every two hours, take a five minute observation break. That means switch my phone off, switch my laptop off, go and stand outside and be still for five minutes every two hours. Do you know how hard it is? You get to be two minutes and you want to look at your phone or you want to get back onto the laptop or you listen to some music, do some breathing exercise, listen to a mindfulness app or whatever, but just every two hours, take those five minutes to just observe, to just recover. You know, athletes do it so well. They train hard, but they also recover. And in today's mad world that we live in, this VUCA world that we live in, you know, we just don't take time out to recover. And so for me, in these challenging times, applying can do 60 minutes. And if you can't find 60, find 30. And find the bits of can do that speak to you and just go and practice this and do it because you will be protecting the most valuable, valuable asset you have. And that is your well-being, your health. Jeff, that's the richest acronym I think I've ever heard. Uh, we're going to put that in the show notes because I think it's 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 really really well thought out and uh i'm i'm as you're talking through it i'm thinking of the things i need to put into practice straight away um and will do so thank you for sharing your story with us um in the show notes we'll also put a link to minds at work and if you have any other uh, resources for anybody that might be listening you want to refer to please send those to us and we'll we'll pop them in there as well because it's so important yeah scott Uh, there's also my website Scott, there's also my website, uh, jeffmcdonald.co.uk. Okay. And there's a whole bunch of resources on that. There's a whole news and resources section mm. that people, I think, might find of value, um, both as leaders and as individuals, as they, Great. Um, as they navigate this world that we live in. Great. Thank you for taking time uh, for this important conversation. It's been an honor to talk to you. you I could talk to you for hours. Um, you're a lovely, lovely man, and thank you for what you're doing in the world. Thank you. And thank you for what you're doing. You, Jean, and and to full. And send in my regards. Thank you. And folks, until next time, remember the world is evolving. Let's each do our part to end the stigma around the conversation about mental wellness. And please share your stories. Mm